Um, hello and welcome to everybody dialed in. Um, welcome to the third day of our virtual Q NAB conference. And got a really special session here. I'm really excited for it. We've got two guests from one of our partners, Disguise, and we're going to be talking about what they do. And they're working with um, doing some really cutting edge things, which I, which I think is exciting. So I'm joined with, um, I'm joined by Ed and Rad from Disguise. And uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining. And um, if you could, please introduce yourselves quickly. Uh, and let's start with Ed. Hi, so I'm Ed Plowman. Uh, I'm CTO at Disguise. Um, uh, I have a background in um, semiconductors, uh, a specialism in uh, media acceleration, and uh, mostly throughout my career, I've been involved with GPUs, 3D graphics. Very cool, thank you. And then uh, Rad. Hello, uh, my name is Rad Altacridi. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Disguise. Um, I came to Disguise after having spent about 20 years in the broadcast television industry in graphics, play out, and lastly at Grass Valley. Excellent, thank you. Um, and I know many of the audience out there, they may not know who Disguise is. So Rad, tell us a little bit about Disguise, who you guys are and what you do. Thanks, Eric. So um, at Disguise, we uh, work with uh, designers to bring the world's most spectacular events to life. Um, if you could just step through, Eric. Um, and so uh, we started uh, out about 15, 20 years ago by powering the uh, onstage visuals for uh, bands such as U2 and Massive Attack. Um, and today, um, our media servers power some of the most exciting experiences out there. Um, if we just step through, we'll just talk about some of the uh, the events we work on. So concert touring, um, it's a big part of our heritage um, and disguise is used to display all the onstage video and graphics that you see in some of the biggest tours out there. This includes, you know, Billie Eilish, uh, Ariana Grande, Foo Fighters and the BTS. Um, next is theater. We, um, you know, as we see theater productions adopting more and more media servers, um, we are now deployed in the majority of the Broadway and West End productions out there, uh, powering all the backdrops and video. And we're also increasingly involved in fixed installations, um, such as the nightly shows on the world's tallest building in Dubai that you see on the top left. We're also um, in various architectural and immersive installations, such as the one you see in the top right here um, at the Atlanta International Airport. Um, next, um, eSports. With the explosion uh, in popularity of all the eSports um, events, we uh, over the years have integrated directly with game engines and um, we've worked on such events as the PUBG uh, Global Invitational amongst a whole host of others. And um, finally, extended reality um, or XR um, combines augmented reality and mixed reality. And this has become a major area of focus for us um, these days. Um, and so our XR solutions um, have, um, have enabled us to deliver some really incredible immersive TV studios, such as the one for ITV studio, uh, sports studios. But we've also um, seen them being used in film. So there's been a significant growth in, in using uh, extended reality for virtual production in film. And we've been we've been there on such productions as uh, Star Wars Solo that you see at the at the bottom left. Yeah. So um, and that that's just a big growth area for us and for the industry in general. Um, just stepping through the next slide. So all this is made possible by um, our software and hardware solutions um, and a passionate community of really talented creatives out there. Um, so we're a global company that supports them and their their creative vision and that in a nutshell is this guy this guy is very cool uh you guys are working in um some really cool areas of technology and i know some areas that are of a lot of interest to uh many of the the folks out there um now quantum and disguise have been engaged in a bit of a partnership and some testing uh this year and I actually think it was it was based on a project that that you referred to more of kind of an infrastructure type of project. I think is kind of what drove the initial engagement. Um, Rad or Ed, can you just talk briefly about how you initially got um, connected with Quantum, 
and kind of what brought you to that, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, the project itself or the the testing that we've done. So um, generally, the projects that we've been asked to work on have been getting steadily larger and larger and larger, <clears throat> and uh, the conversation uh, around storage started uh probably about midway through last year um when we were in the midst of um missioning a very large project for uh dubai 2020 um the Al Sal plaza um so this uh this is the largest i think it, I, i'm right in saying for the moment it's the largest single uh single canvas multi-projector um mm. uh, installation that I think anybody's ever done in the world. Um, uh, and the sheer number of projectors, it, it runs into 100 plus projectors, um, which all have to be serviced with content. And they're all pulling from slightly different areas of a single content pool. Um, the solution that we came up with for that particular um, installation was to have distributed servers. So there was a server node for each uh, or a, a small collection of projector heads. Um, but we realized that's not an ideal situation to be in um, for scale out of these, what we call enterprise scale projects. And we had at least three more projects on the horizon. So we were starting to look at, um, uh, rather than the traditional way of doing things in our industry, which is um, uh, if you need more, more capability, throw more boxes at it, uh, to, to look towards enterprise um, scale out solutions. And that's when we started looking around for um, uh, network attached storage, for want of a better description. Um, but nothing really um, uh, seemed to service our needs uh, because we were looking for both scale and throughput at the same time. Scale and throughput, that's certainly one of the things we uh, were known for here with Stornax. So you, you started to look around. Um, and I know we've we've been engaged with you guys and even um, uh, have actually been doing some proof of concept testing using our Stornext file system and our F series NVMe servers. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that just that project, that test process, and what some of your takeaways have been? So the interesting thing is when you start shopping around for solutions like this, everybody will tell you they have the perfect solution for you. Um, one of the biggest challenges is uh, we're on the Windows, uh, we're Windows-based um, architecture, um, which is uh, challenge number one for most people. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, uh, I guess the, 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 the second biggest challenge is the, the type of thing we want to do means that we have very large files um, um, and we want to random access into them. And we want to uh, we want to do that very quickly with very high bandwidth. Um, a lot of people will approach you with solutions where um, a single unit, so uh, the equivalent of a single F series um, uh, kind of NVMe unit, um, they'll approach you with something that looks like that. Um, but then you have to do all the software work to manage the workload uh, across those mm -hmm. uh, across those systems. So you're basically buying a bare a bare bones NVMe array. And then they're asking you to do all the software work to uh, to manage all of that. And while we could have done that, um, it's it's not where we want to be. It's not where we want to go. It's not where our expertise is. So when we were talking, uh, one of the things that uh, kind of uh, shone out from the quantum solution was the fact that we could scale out across multiple. The file system was staying consistent. We didn't have to worry about where each of the files was. We just needed a really fat pipe going in and out of everything to make sure we could sustain the bandwidth. Um, in the, the POC, uh, another thing you come across is people will quote you theoretical maximum bandwidth capability. Um, but when you add the reality of an operating system and drivers and other overheads, uh, we weren't sure whether we could really tap that out to its maximum potential. And that's, um, that's really what the POC was all about. Um, the, the quantum engineers helped us get to a point where um, uh, both sides were happy that not only uh, were we seeing peak performance and we, were, uh, we really were seeing peak performance, we were saturating line rate um, or very, very close to line rate um, on uh, 100 gigabit ethernet cards. And uh, we also tested a fiber channel system 
and we were getting very, very much closer than we thought we'd get uh, with very small margins for the, uh, the operating system overhead and the other, uh, the other file system overheads. And we were able to do exactly what we needed to do. And uh, we then had confidence that that would scale out because we, when, once we tried that on one unit, we scaled across two units and we saw the doubling of the, the, the bandwidth and the capability. Um, for one of the installations we were looking at, we were looking at going up to 30 units wide. So it was very critical for us that we needed to understand that this thing would scale properly, and we got that confidence from the POC. Very cool. It's great to hear, and um, <clears throat> I think it also gives it gives our audience a flavor for the the scale of these projects that you guys are working on for your clients. Um, let's um, let's toss a question over to Rad here. I mean. I know from our experience working with you, um, a couple of these infrastructure projects as well were actually impacted by the COVID pandemic or, you know, pushed out, obviously very common. Um, what other trends have you guys seen with your clients in terms of, um, you know, just the impact of the pandemic and kind of where companies are starting to shift the focus as it pertains to you know, what you guys do? So um, what we've seen is, um, you know, a lot of the, the live events, so the concert touring and so on, has obviously kind of slowed down dramatically. Yeah. Um, but two trends carry on. So one is fixed installations are still, um, there's still some momentum there, um, and those are growing bigger and bigger. So to use the example that Ed brought up, so that project was about 240 projectors, um, which was unprecedented when, when we put it together. Um, the the trend now is towards bigger and bigger uh, projects and bigger and bigger canvases. So we're now looking at some projects that are in excess of 400 projectors. So it just gives you the level of scale that's uh, that's being attempted out there as everyone's trying to push the envelope further and further. So that's on the fixed installation side, and and there's still momentum there. The other side that has actually grown quite dramatically over the past uh, couple of months since um, the the pandemic started was. Um, is the, the whole extended reality side of, um, of, um, of the market. Um, it's I mean, people are looking at it as a way of a more immersive um, distance um, communication mechanism. So having, you know, instead of a Zoom call, you can have a Zoom call in a smart stage that um, immerses the, um, uh, the presenter um, with, with their audience. Um, it's also um, enabling some, um, sort of remote concerts to take place where people would film that with a backdrop um, of, of a mixed reality and augmented reality in there as well. So that's actually started to really take off over the past couple of months. It's always had momentum, but it's really kicked into overdrive recently. Yeah, I, I, that's really interesting. And I, I'd like for you to talk a little bit more about that if you could. Um, a lot of the audience that's on the line and many of our customers make come from, you know, broadcast, from post-production and, um, you know, big studios. With the social distancing measures that are in place, I know that many of our customers are looking more at um, producing content using those types of techniques. Uh, can you just talk a little bit more about, I don't know, how that would work and how Disguise kind of plugs into those types of workflows? Sure. So, I mean, um... At a high level, the, um, the, the setup involves um, typically sort of LED screens that are set up um, as walls and a floor. Um, and the other key components are, you know, a camera with a tracking system and disguise really at the heart of the overall solution, pulling it all together. Um, and so the disguise media server would manage all the incoming feeds and all the, the graphics going out to, to these screens and synchronize all that and track it so that it's perspective tracked. So if you've got someone with a backdrop standing in the stage, as you pan and tilt the camera, then the the um, the graphics behind the presenter would move around to correct to correctly map to the perspective of of the of the camera feed. Um, it also allows the um, um, the um, presenter to interact with the space. So um, we also have tracking systems that can integrate um, with um, um, you know on on body trackers and so on to allow him or her to, to move content around. And that can be placed in front of them in augmented reality or behind them again as part of the, uh, of the backdrop. Very cool. Um, 
And we are talking about, we're talking about NVMe quite a bit at this conference. And, you know, it, maybe first to add a question to you on just what are the implications to kind of the storage infrastructure with this type of deployment? And then, Rad, I think we'll come back to you for what are the other implications to kind of workflows in terms of how to do that. But first, Ed, as you think about that type of extended reality and that type of uh, um, ways to produce content, what do you see as some of the implications to the storage infrastructure um, and the needs related to that? Well, I mean, the world that we work in um, doesn't uh, tolerate compression well. <laughs> um, so the, uh, what I mean by that is um, uh, everything has to look spot on and look perfect. Um, so when uh, generally um, resolutions of assets are getting higher, um, compression, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's just simple things like when we talk about video in these environments, we're not talking about H.265, H.264, uh, and, and anything with temporal compression, we're, we're, uh, we're using um, uh, basically uh, sequenced images uh, with uh, a small amount of compression laid over top. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's very challenging to deliver that content quickly to, um, to the playheads. Um, so when you have these kind of discussions and you talk about video in our context, people tend to think you're talking about, uh, you know, Okay, so your non editing suites, and okay, these are solved problems for storage systems. But actually, uh, when we start talking about our needs and our requirements, um, you know, the, uh, the the film sets and the LEDs are capable of um, supporting uh, way higher um, uh, sort of higher dynamic range color representation mm -hmm. than your standard display system, or uh, certainly some projector systems. And, uh, and and the cameras uh, are also very sensitive to uh, to HDR input now. So everything's getting, um, uh, file sizes aren't getting smaller uh, anytime soon. They're just getting larger and more of it is coming. So um, when you start uh, putting these scenes together, you're layering multiple of these assets over the top of each other. You're combining that or streaming that into a real-time 3D environment, which is also consuming a lot of data. Um, this has to come from somewhere. You, you can't store it all in the machine or you can store a limited amount of it. So, uh, you know, having that backing store is very, very important. I have to imagine for some of these deployments that you guys are doing where, you know, RAD, as you said, it's maybe 400 projectors, uh, you know, hundreds of projectors. You guys are really at the forefront of uh, solving some of those problems. Um, kind of coming back to the I guess I would say extended reality approach a little bit and thinking about, you know, uses and more traditional workflows. Um, I guess opening up to both of you, I mean, what are you guys seeing as kind of where things go next um, given COVID and, and we've, I mean, we've kind of seen and we've heard already that some aspects of workflows have probably changed forever. Uh, you know, this has been kind of a forcing function for people to try out new technology, but just maybe tossing it over to Rad, give us your perspective on, you know, what do you see happening next in the media industry and, and from Disguise's vantage point, you know, what's, what's coming next? What are some of the big trends you guys are focused on? So, yeah, I mean, so we talked about extended reality, and we see that as a very strong trend in the space that we're in, certainly. Um, but then expanding that even further to um, to have collaborative extended reality over the, the public internet, right? So the ability to, to bridge those, um, those experiences together. Um, the other thing we see happening with our, own, um, with our own user base is the need to collaborate creatively again um, online. So that, you know, the creative process is not being done on one um, machine on one, on, in one premises. It's to allow multiple artists to collaborate um, with content residing in, um, you know, on the public cloud somewhere. So that's also driving that um, that uh, trend of, you know, sort of social distancing, right? So, um, so those are the the two major trends that we see happening in our space. In addition to the underlying, things are getting bigger. So with fixed installations, anyway, uh, carrying on there is the trend to, to growth, to doing bigger and bigger productions. 
Very cool. And how about from you, Ed? Yeah, what's coming up next? Yeah, to give to to give you a sense of the scale of that, I mean, the 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 Albus Al project, uh, the the canvas is um, off the top of my head, it's seven k by twenty k pixels. Wow. Um, and there's multiple layers of uh, of either video or generative content on top of that, um, uh, which is being composited together in real time. So this is um, this is uh, fairly you know, aggressive stuff. And, and like Rad said, that's just the beginning. Um, in terms of uh, how people are uh, putting together that kind of information, um, uh, they're more and more, uh, we've actually just uh, done our um, our own uh, working from home release. Uh, we we uh, had a few things on the back burner um, uh, that we've been looking at to put into the product. And uh, when our staff started working from home, obviously they use our product as well. So they said, oh, you know, the, these these things would be awesome if we had them now. Uh, so we accelerated that and did a, a, a quick run on a short release to enable those kind of things. And they're just uh, very basic remote working uh, activities. And we're increasing the ability uh, for people using the Disguise software to work remotely and collaboratively together and we're we're always looking for opportunities to do that. Um, obviously, then the next challenge is um, uh, the materials these guys are working with. Where does that reside? Where do we keep it? Um, is it hosted? Is it uh, is it in the cloud? Um, so that's going to be probably our our next major challenge as these things get really big <laughs> yeah. and need to be uh, have more and more processing capability thrown at them. Uh, that's probably going to be uh, one of the bigger challenges. Yeah, you know, um, I want to talk about that for a second. Uh, and Rad, you also alluded to this earlier, kind of the role of the public cloud. I think that's such a hot topic right now. And I think the cloud has moved to, it, it's moved from being something that was kind of theoretical, or maybe many of our clients were using the public cloud for archiving. But I think it's been shifting to become a more integral part of the production process. You know, companies are using cloud bursting for rendering, stuff like that. Um, and I think the pandemic here is going to be an accelerant. Um, how, how are you guys seeing some of your clients kind of use the public cloud thinking about and think about kind of on-prem versus cloud, maybe some of the challenges there. So Rad, let's get your perspective on that first. So the way, um, our industry sees it, at least for the sort of short to, to medium term, is it's going to be a hybrid solution. So you'll use the, the public cloud for the activities that require remote collaboration. But currently we deliver, and you know, as Ed mentioned, the content is large, the latency requirements are, are quite strict. So the actual play out of the media and the delivery of the media needs to happen near where the, the action is, so to speak, right? So the, yeah. the servers need to reside next to the, the displays and the content needs to live there for play out. Now, what you, we expect to see is people will collaborate and build it over the public cloud, but then once that's ready, the content will be uh, brought back down to the on-prem um, um, servers for play out. And it's gonna remain a hybrid setup for, for some time to come until we can get to a point where the latency from the public cloud to the premises um, is managed, which will take some time in the end. In the, end um, the speed of light is the speed of light. And so yeah. there will be some challenges to overcome there. But yes, so we do see a hybrid approach for the for this sort of foreseeable future. It, yeah, I, I mean, we agree. Um, and hybrid cloud means different things to different industries and I think you know there's going to be all different forms of hybrid one of the things we're really focused on here at quantum is trying to make it as seamless as we can to move between both both uh, on-premise and the cloud as well as multiple clouds because I think there will be uh, different reasons why our customers may want to use the different big public cloud providers um, one other thing I'm interested to see rad kind of building on what you said is we know we're going to see a decrease in latency over the internet, but I think on top of that, um, you know, Ed mentioned you guys are doing compositing on a 7K uh, 
HD now, it'll be interesting to see where the resolutions go over the next five to 10 years, because you may be doing some massive uh, projects with massive screens as well. So <laughs> any commentary on that? Well, I mean, one of the reasons why a lot of people are coming to us at the moment is uh, we broke the 16K by 16K barrier quite early uh, early on. Now, for those of okay. you who aren't aware, the, the reason 16K by 16K is a barrier is because that's the maximum uh, render to texture job you can do on a single GPU. Um, mm. uh, chopping that up over multiple GPUs requires a bit of expert knowledge. Um, it wasn't the most efficient process uh, in the world, although um, I have to say NVIDIA uh, uh, have made some great uh, strides towards improving that. But it's not um, it's not a seamless process. It's not just the case that you can uh, you can take a canvas and chop it up. Uh, a lot of the work that we do is not um, reproducing those pixels on a flat surface. Uh, they're on complex surfaces. So we do spatial mapping. So it's not a direct relationship of uh, I'm just producing a rectangle of pixels end by end. Um, we have to uh, we have to remap those pixels in very creative ways to make them look spatially correct when they hit the surface. So it's it's even worse than you think, and uh, it, it's yeah. uh, it's it's getting crazier and crazier. Um, uh, every every time we uh, every month in the office or just so in 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 the company, um, uh, I think I've heard the the, the most extreme request. And then the next one um, uh, comes along. So uh, we've had people ask for the best plot, uh, uh, a mapping job on the best plot of uh, five or six city blocks, uh, the equivalent. Um, yeah. That's that's the latest one. That's pretty significant. Um, all in 4K, all in HDR, all. In <laughs> and then it's a bit of a head scratcher to go. Okay, how are we going to do this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very cool and, and very interesting. Um, I, I really appreciate your guys' time. This has been great. I, I think there's a lot of interest here on, on chat and other. Um, let's, let's take a few questions and then um, I'll give you uh, both an opportunity just to uh, close this out. But uh, I do wanna offer a bit of time for questions. So for those on the line, if you haven't submitted a question yet, feel free to do that over uh, Q&A. And we'll we'll take questions here for a few minutes and then adjourn. So, um, the uh, first question we got in, I think this one's for Ed, and it's asking a little bit more about. Can you elaborate on the throughput that, in terms of kind of gig per second, that you got with the um, uh, testing that you did with Stornex? I know it's pretty detailed, but can you kind of talk about that a little bit? So um, the, the particular Stornex uh, implementation we went for um, uh, was actually uh, using a fiber channel backbone. Um, uh, we would have liked to have used the IP backbone, but um, uh, I, don't, I don't think we could quite make it, uh, make it work with what we wanted at the scale we wanted and fiber channel was a better bet. So uh, I think we were getting per, uh, we were able to saturate per channel, uh, something like 12 gigabits, um, uh, and we had an aggregation of, I think, four channels per card um, uh, is what we were looking at. Uh, the upshot of it was we were able to stream uh, uninhibited uh, four, 4K DCI uncompressed streams at 12-bit per, per playback head. And we were looking at scaling that to, I think it was 28 playback heads. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, and actually, Ed, um, one of the other sessions that I've been leading during our virtual Q&AB is focused on our F-Series product. And there have been a lot of questions about networking options, right? You've got the 100 gig using RDMA or you've got fiber. Could you just talk a little bit more about, you know, you said ultimately you guys have decided to go with fiber for different reasons. Can you kind of talk for a minute about the kind of your evaluation of both and and why you ended up with fiber okay. a little bit, some of the learnings as you looked at some of the networking options. Okay, so the limitation, we, or not limitation, but the practicalities that drove us towards fiber channel uh, were mostly around our, uh, the version of Windows that we were running on <clears throat> for various reasons. Excuse me. 
we're running on a Windows client rather than Windows Server, and uh, the RDMA capabilities and the, the features which are required to make uh, RDMA and uh, uh, standard IP NIC work uh, weren't really available to us. Um, that's nothing to do with uh, quantum or any of their engineering capability and absolutely to do with the conversation that everybody seems to have to have with Microsoft uh, about RDMA support in general. Um, so that drove us down the fiber channel route and uh, uh, we were using HBAs inside the box of uh, fiber channel HBAs. So we didn't encounter any of those problems because when at that point we're not going through um, uh, Windows infrastructure inside the inside the, the Windows kernel, we're going through a, a, a direct to uh, Stornex uh, software stack. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, just very interesting stuff. I really appreciate your guys' time. Um, Rad, we, we're getting some questions where if our, if some of our clients are interested in learning more about this guys or even working with you guys, What's the right next steps they should take? Okay, well, um, best thing to do, uh, I'd say, as, at a start, is go to www.disguise.one. And in there, there'll be a, a way to contact us with any follow-up questions, and we will route your query to the right place. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you, guys. I, I guess that's really all the questions we have on chat. I'm, I'm getting a few comments of just, exciting stuff and really interesting. So, um, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining uh, this discussion. And, um, you know, we look forward to continuing our partnership with the skies. And I have to say, I just think you guys are working in some very, very exciting areas of um, multimedia and extended reality. Very cool. So, thank you very much. And, thank you. Uh, thanks for joining the panel. For, for the rest of the folks out there, um, Please uh, continue to participate in our third day of virtual QNAB. We do have some additional sessions lined up throughout today, and we'll continue to cover a number of interesting topics. And so enjoy the rest of our show, and we'll be speaking a little bit later. Thank you.